Great. Well, I'm just going to share for a few moments uh, about the Holy Spirit and about Pentecost, and then we're going to spend some more time leaning in and worshiping and seeing what God has to say. Uh, and I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad that we get to uh, join this day, Pentecost. Tomorrow night, by the way, is our uh, worship, uh, Monday night prayer night. So we're here in the cave at 7.30 if you want to join us. We're just seeing it's a, it's a season to press in and seek God with new sense of zeal and passion. Um, I had a, we're going to get straight into this this morning. I had two pictures in my mind just uh, as we were worshiping there. And the first was of, of dry uh, dry kindling and dry firewood, and I was like, "Well, that's interesting, isn't it?" And then the Lord was like, "What happens when you when you take a match to wet wood?" Uh, and I was like, "Well, you know, anybody anybody ever gone hiking and you've got to the hut and there's some wood there, but it's wet? Uh, that's a difficult place to be. Uh, and you, what you want is you want dry wood. And I, I felt like God was just wanting to encourage someone who feels dry. You feel in a dry season with God. You are you are." primed and ready for a fresh ignition of the Holy Spirit. Amen? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. (laughs) The other one is I just, I heard in my spirit the sense of a rumbling and it was, I don't want to trigger anybody here, but it was like, uh, it was like a rumbling that comes as the earthquakes on its way and and I am certainly not prophesying any earthquakes. Uh, We have had our enough, right? We have had our share. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but in the Spirit, and I, I was thinking about that, because often when you think about the Holy Spirit coming, you think about rain, the rain of God, or the fresh wind, or this outpouring coming from the heavens. But, but there's two pictures uh, in the Bible of, of the water and the Spirit's move. One is coming from above, and one is the ground beginning to open and springs welling up from within the ground. And, and uh, on you know, 11th, uh, February the 11th earthquake, we went for a walk. And we just we were you know terrified in many ways by this this the springs and liquefaction coming up from the ground. But I get a sense that that's what God is doing in the spirit in the season. There's a rumbling and He's shaking what can be shaken. Our old reliances, everything that's not built on the rock, a solid foundation, is being shaken. Why? So He can teach us a lesson. No, so He can bring a fresh spring of His spirit and life and hope and healing. And so uh, again, that's kind of what just uh, jumped out to me. And I felt like God is getting us ready. There is a rumbling in the Spirit. And I kind of pray that it would build. And as we pray together and worship together in just a few moments, that there would be fresh springs of life and deliverance and salvation and encounter and experience with the love of God springing up in this place. On that note, let me pray. Father, I thank you that you sent your Spirit. And I thank you that Holy Spirit, you are here with us, that we don't have to uh, beg or plead. We just have to learn to open our hearts and open our eyes to see, to receive. And so that's the posture of our hearts today. Holy Spirit, have your way. Fill us afresh, we pray. Speak to us through Scripture. Lead us into truth that we may take a hold of all that is available to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start in John chapter 16 this morning. And... uh, I'm going to start a passage there, and then we're going to move to Acts chapter two. And I, I just want to, I just want to remind us of some things. Uh, I want to, I want to maybe we'll learn some things today, but more likely we're going to be reminded and reminded for good reason. I, I think part of the challenge of the Christian journey in pastoring or leading in church is that we we have these highlights in the calendar that are wonderful, but they carry attention. Easter is this beautiful time of remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But our passion and our desire is not that we would think about that once a year, that we would live in the reality and the wonder of that every day of our lives, that Jesus died atoning for our sin, rose again, showing that there is life beyond the grave, that there is resurrection life available to us. Oh, that we would walk in that every day of our lives, right? And then we get to Pentecost, which is, Pent means five, and so this. uh, uh, 50, it's a celebration of 50 days. It's not new to the New Testament. It was the, it was the, the Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament or the Feast of the Harvest, uh, seven weeks after 
uh, uh, Passover, they would celebrate. The harvest had finished. Uh, seven would be f- weeks would be 49. For those who are thinking out there, that's right. The very next day, they would celebrate. Uh, day 50 after the Passover. And so Jesus kind of overlaid that with this new paradigm of the cross and his sacrifice and wait. It's because I'm going to pour out my spirit. And it's not the only time now that God is pouring out his spirit. And also, it's not just once a year that we come and go, Holy Spirit, move in my lives. Our prayer is that every day we would wake and we would go, good morning, Holy Spirit. I'm I'm open to you. I'm yielded to you this morning. Speak to me. Lead me. Guide me. I need you. I'm dependent on your goodness and grace. I want to walk in fresh encounter and experience. So, you know, I'm reminding us this morning of some things. Reminding us so that God could reawaken something in our hearts this morning. All right. John chapter 16, we're going to read verses 7 through to 15. And Jesus is speaking and he says, But very truly, I tell you that it is for your good that I am going away. Now, uh, I think I've got the NRSV up here this morning on the screen. I'm reading from the New International Vision. But nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. That's interesting, isn't it? We'll come back to that. It is for your advantage that I go away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me or trust in me or give their allegiance to me, not that they don't have this mental assent. People who don't give their loyalty or trust to me anymore. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you that you cannot bear now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak not of his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All That belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now, just just a little side note on this dynamic, and we'll talk a little bit more in a few moments about who the Holy Spirit is, but uh, I just want to point out, I I just want to come back to that first verse where Jesus is saying, it is for your advantage. Now, if if you're like me, You've probably thought at some point in your life, in your Christian journey, those of you who are Jesus followers, have probably got to a point in your life and you thought, Jesus, if you were just here with me now, this, I, I could get through this. If you could just turn up in the flesh, potentially, because you did that with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, if you could just be here, present, and just talk to me and tell me or just deal with that or deal with this issue for me, if you could just, have you ever felt like that? If Jesus was just here, present, in the flesh, then I would be okay. And he says, hey, it is for your advantage that that's not the case. I have something better for you in mind. What could be better than Jesus standing here in the flesh? The Holy Spirit coming. dwelling inside of us. Have you got a revelation of that? Have you got a revelation that it is better for you than better than Jesus standing right sitting right next to you now is that the spirit is with you and within you. I, I don't know, just reading scripture this morning, that's kind of how it reads to me. Anybody else is kind of picking up what he's putting down? What do we know about the Holy Spirit? Well, he is God. We understand the Bible makes it really clear that God is one in three, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not three Aspects of the God, but three distinct persons of the Godhead. Not some power. I think it's easy to think the Holy Spirit's a power. 
just a presence, uh, like a, you know, a ghost. This old, King, old King James translation, it was the Holy Ghost, but a ghost like a sort of misty, hovery sort of, no, 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 a person. As much a person as the Father, as much a person as the Son, as much, as much a person as the, Holy, as the Holy Spirit. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in this beautiful, unending, eternal relationship that we're invited into. Now, what Jesus is teaching us is not exhaustive of the Holy Spirit, but these few verses teaches us that the Holy Spirit is called the advocate. The word there is parakletos. Uh, para means to come alongside. It's a, the Holy Spirit is our helper, the one who comes alongside, our comforter, our helper. All these things could be translated from that word parakletos. The one who comes to your aid. What does he do? Well, he comes and he brings conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Have we got time to unpack that? But what a beautiful thing, the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings. And our hearts where we are rejecting the will and way of God, which when we do that, we get bent out of shape. Our humanity is bent out of shape when we reject God's will and ways, and the Spirit comes in love to convict us, to straighten us up to put our humanity back to God's original design. Uh, it goes on and says, He'll guide you into truth. Now, that has a lot to do... Uh, well, there's a big conversation going on around truth, isn't there? In our late modern slash post-modern psyche. Can you know truth? According to Scripture, you can. And truth has a name. His name's Jesus. So truth is a reality. And the Holy Spirit's going to guide us into truth, guide us to Jesus. He says in those final verses that the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. So one of the fundamental roles of the Spirit of God is pointing people towards Jesus. Just like one of the fundamental roles of Jesus is to point people towards the Father. One of the fundamental roles of the Father is to pour out His Spirit. <laughs> this is this beautiful, beautiful interaction. Let me read from Acts chapter 2. How are we doing? Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, and they were together in one place. It just, if I was going to distract myself, I'd, just, I'd point out they were together in one place. It's not accidental. God draws us into his family and integration into the family of God is essential for understanding our salvation. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. What seemed, now, that's a great word, what seemed, it, it, uh, Luke Theologian Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is pointing out here that he's, he's going to give some definition, but it's, there's something about the Spirit that is a mystery. And it's kind of like, but it's not a complete picture. Uh, it seemed like tongues of fire. Is that, that's my best effort to try and describe what was happening. That separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Up until this point, and this again is 50 days after the resurrection. Up until this point, the disciples were filled with confusion and uncertainty. What do we do? The Jesus that we thought, the Messiah that we thought, who would overthrow Rome and establish his kingdom literally and free us from oppression, died, but then he rose again and then he just disappeared back into heaven. What are we to make of this? We now believe, we've seen evidence, the resurrection of Jesus. We, we believe he is the king of the heavens and earth, and yet he's gone. And he gave us these funny words of like, it's better that I go. Oh, I don't understand it. But they were obedient to the words of Jesus. He said, gather and pray. 
until the day comes. And when the day came, the Spirit of God filled them. Now, up until this point, the old covenant was this idea that where, where God dwells is in the temple. And this is, a, this is a mega shift of paradigm. And he goes, now you are my temple. This is why, by the way, be wary. You've got, we've got to really work out this whole thing of, about God's plan and purpose and coming back and all this sort of thing. And particularly phrases like the holy land, that is one that we have to be very clear. The holy land now, where the temple was, is everywhere I am and where you are. So the holy land expanded. It is no longer one place according to the New Testament. And that's very, very clear as we read Scripture. It was expanded because I now, filled by the Spirit of God, am the temple of God. So are you. Woo! I am glad. Otherwise, I'd be going to Jerusalem as regularly as I could. What about you? <laughs> now, the Spirit of God came and filled the believers, the disciples, and it was game on. The uncertainty dissipated. They got up and began to declare the gospel. 3,000 believers were added that day, then baptized, and the next, and it just went... And we read the book of Acts. If you haven't read the book of Acts, oh, please read the book of Acts. Or second Luke, I like to call it. First Luke talks about salvation. Second Luke talks about the expansion of the message of salvation by the Spirit through the church. It's game on. Why? Because they have the Spirit now. For revolution to become all that God has in mind, we have to be people that are filled with the Spirit. For us to become the evangelistic people that God's calling us to, this it, in this new set, we are convinced we are going into a new season of upholding the gospel and seeing people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, yes. radically converted, yes. transformed by the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus, the work of the Spirit in their lives. Yeah. We, we, we need the Spirit of God to be working in us and through it, to raise up an army of world changers that we can send into the nations and send to have influence in business and other areas of life. We need the Spirit of God to grip our hearts and move and fill us and empower us. I would say, as Lexi's already said, beware of lukewarm Christianity. Yeah. There's too much in the Western church. Yeah. This, this sense of, oh, well, you know, I'll pray only when I need something. <laughs> Said only a lukewarm Christian. Because those who are not lukewarm say, oh, I pray because I want to meet with you every moment I can, Jesus. Uh, beware, you know, church, church for the lukewarm Christian becomes a place where you just go to get something out of it, not to contribute. Uh, discipleship is only about your growth, not you playing a part in discipling somebody else. Do you realize you were born again by the Spirit of God? You were born to fulfill the Great Commission and make disciples? Yeah. But we need the Spirit to birth that and stir that and cultivate that. Uh, in our midst, people walk into church and like, well, I hope the worship team's good today to kind of get me in the mo mode. Said only lukewarm Christians. Yeah. Not someone who's filled and fired and, and filled with the presence of God and Spirit of God. Because they're like, ah, oh, man, I can't wait. I'm there. I'm praising God. I'm believing. I'm encouraging. I'm playing my part in the body of Christ as we gather. Yes. <laughs> so this is the work of the Spirit to fire us up, to consume us. And I want to bring us back to life filled, led, and empowered by the Spirit. And everybody said... Amen. Who wants to live dangerously? All right. Two things I want to point out that are really, really important about the work of the Holy Spirit. Firstly, I want to say this is my first point this morning. Taking a breath. Christianity begins and is sustained by the Spirit. Now, let me read to you from Galatians chapter 3. This is Paul. Paul is, has a lot to say on the Spirit. In fact, all of his epistles are going to be giving us an aspect of the work of the Spirit in the church. To the Galatian church, he says this, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I.e., he's pointing out the atoning work of Christ as central to a life of faith. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the Lord? Why has he gone from the work of Christ to receiving the Spirit? 
as if it's one and the same thing. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you had heard? Again, the word believing there is not what we think in the modern view of, yes, I believe that, X, Y, Z. I put my trust in, loyalty, allegiance to what I've heard. Are you foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit? You're now trying to finish by the means of the flesh, your own strength? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So I ask you again, does God give you a spirit and work miracles amongst you by the works of the law or by believing what you have heard? So also Abraham believed in God and was credited to him to his righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Starts here, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Uh, it's commonly agreed by modern interpreters that this today would be better translated as, you turkeys who pulled the wool over your eyes. Okay, that's my, that's my translation. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed that. Uh, that was for my benefit, not yours. Paul, Paul uses strong language here, and he says, you're slipping back into something that is killing your Christianity. It is killing your faith. He says, after beginning by the means of the Spirit. What's he saying there? He's saying the Christian faith begins as a work of the Spirit, renewing our heart. That is how we came to faith. Jesus said, unless a person is born again, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So Paul is very, very clear that we are saved as a work of the Spirit as we trust in the finished work of Christ. Did you receive the Spirit? By the works of the law. He, he, in fact, if you go on and read the rest of Paul, he's pretty convinced that if the Spirit of God is not in you, you're not a Christian. Not my words, Paul's. Now, this is not a uh, power just imitating from God. It's God, God living in you. The prayer of the people throughout the Bible is, God, we don't just want your power. We want your presence. Moses said, if, we don't, if you don't come with us, do not send us into the promised land. When you become a Christian, you receive the Spirit of God. And you're born again, an inside work, a miraculous work of the Spirit of God. Well, that's nice. Nice? That's not nice. That's outrageous. That's revolutionary. That's radical. Out of this world. Not nice. <laughs> Some people want, I just want to have a nice faith journey. <laughs> okay. Have you met Jesus yet? J.I. Packer, a great theologian, says, he asked the question when reflecting on this. He says, have you been melted with spiritual understandings of the glory that has come to you? There is something miraculous that takes place when we put our trust in Jesus. He goes on, Galatians 5, he says, uh, and then he's going to talk about the rest that we have. Uh, Galatians 5, 16, uh, 16 and 17, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit. So our walk with God is by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, but the Spirit contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. What's this saying? It's saying... Paul is making this going on from this idea it begins, Christianity begins with the Spirit coming in you. And see, our ability to walk out the ways that God wants is partnering with the Spirit's work in us in an ongoing sense. Uh, becoming a Christian happens when the Spirit comes to you. Living a godly life, which is one of the main priorities of the Spirit in you, is about the Spirit of God contending in us against the old flesh nature to live godly, victorious, and achieving the promises of God or pursuing the promises of God. In other words, it would be unfair to God to look at sinful humanity and say, well, here you go, here's the work of the cross. I'll forgive you guys. Now buck up your ideas and start towing the line. Do the best you can to follow my ways. 
Why? Because we still have this old nature that pulls back towards self and is unable in our own strength to follow him. So instead he says, right, here you go. You're forgiven. Now, because I want you to live a victorious life and walk out of your old patterns of the past, I'm going to give the spirit to live inside you to contend within you. And you learn to surrender to his empowering. You'll be able to live the life that I want you to live. In other words, let me give you a a summary of that. The Spirit of God brings us into the family of God. The Spirit of God then helps us grow in our relationship with God. The Spirit of God then works on the inside of us so that we will bear the resemblance of the family of God. In other words, start looking more and more like Jesus. That's not inwardly, that's characteristically. Uh, Sorry, that's not outwardly, that is inwardly. Uh, You know, uh, bearing the family resemblance is about looking like the life of Christ increasingly. The Spirit, of course, according to Paul, is also going to build, bring about the unity within the family. When we resist, when we, when we won't resolve issues and conflicts and offenses with one another, we're resisting the work of the Spirit in our community. Oh, about time the church talked about quenching the Spirit. Mm, well, let's talk about how we quench the Spirit when we gossip about each other and won't talk to each other. Just saying, all right, we don't want the Bible this morning. We're just scripture. We just want to stay with our own ideas. Are we going <laughs> to? Uh, then he brings the gifts. The Spirit brings the gifts to the body of Christ that we can uh, give demonstration to, to the world and build up one another with the gifts of the Spirit. And then he empowers us to grow the family of God, to bring others. So the Spirit is for us, but not just for us. In fact, when we just make the Spirit all about how can we just have a nice time together, we are in danger of grieving the Spirit because the Spirit wants to empower us to be a bold witness in the world of what Jesus looks like when he redeems humanity. Well, I'm just not a, I'm just not a good witness to my faith, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't know how to witness to my faith. Well, good news The Spirit of God is an amazing witness to Jesus, and He is inside of you. So, Christianity begins and sustained by the Spirit, but there is more. Free Ginsu Nice with every order. No, I'm kidding. Does anybody remember Ginsu Nice? Is that just got to be a certain vintage, don't we? Yeah, you probably, you know, if you grew up without a cell phone, you probably remember what I'm talking about. The Bible also talks about this idea of being filled or being baptized in the Spirit. So here's my second point. This is more of a statement for us as a faith community. We will pursue the ongoing filling and empowerment of the Spirit. So you come into this idea of Pentecost, and after that, there's this conversation around being baptized in the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit. Now, baptized means to be dipped or immersed in something or to be completely saturated. This is where, in my view, in the world of theology as well, there's like where we're trying to explain things and, and, and probably we're doing our best with the mysterious part of the working of God. The nature of this topic of discussion, I wonder if it's rather, instead of us getting more of God somehow, I wonder if it has to do with God getting more of us. I say that because Paul and Luke, the two theologians in the New Testament on the, on the, on the, on the Spirit, and Luke is a, a narrative theologian, and Paul is more didactic, and they both tell us a lot about the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to the term of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're not entirely sure that they, they're, they're meaning the same things, and since they jump back, baptized, filled. And so there is this area, and there's a part of the church that goes, well, actually, you get baptized in the Spirit when you're born again. Now, because how can you get something more of a person? There's some good argument in there, uh, and and there's a trickiness to this whole conversation. And then right out the other extreme, now it's a completely separate thing. uh, And and there's iterations in the middle that go, now you get the Spirit when you're born again, but but there's an unpacking of the Spirit that comes at a separate uh, separate moment or a separate experience. And, And for the sake of actually just going, well... In my mind, I've, I studied this actually at Bible college almost 30 years ago again, and I kind of landed that position for myself, and relatively I keep looking, and it hasn't necessarily uh, changed. But I, I would like to say that what's really important to me, and this is why I use the term of being filled 
uh, more so. What's really important to me, and particularly when you read the book of Acts, you'll see they were saved, they were filled with the Spirit, but there are other occasions again where they were filled with the Spirit again. And so in my mind, I am convinced that we get the Spirit at salvation and there are points regularly along the line where God is wanting to fill us. Now again, bear in mind my way of saying that would be fill a bath, There's a person in there. Can you fit any more water in there? No, you can't. Unless you take the person out, then there's more room for more water. To be filled with the Spirit, there's still too much of my old ways or my own addictions or my own tendencies or my self-nature. Remove some of those. There's room for him and more, but probably more technically, he is getting more of me. Whichever way you want to land on that, uh, we're okay. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ. We can have a different sort of slant on that. What is really important is that we come to understand that every Christian has the Spirit, but according to the Bible, it would appear that not every Christian is filled with the Spirit. In other words, fully yielded to the power and the presence and the gifts of God operating through their lives. So, I'll say that again. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit, but my conviction is that not every Christian is filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, let's look at this. Now, coming back to Paul, don't want to confuse you with this, but we've got to embrace that there's tensions here and there's a wrestling here, and let's just bring it all back to, is there areas of my life that the Holy Spirit does not yet have access to and allowed to operate through? If the answer is yes, you need to be filled with the Spirit again. So do I. There's tons of areas. Every day. <laughs> Where I don't reflect the kingdom in an area of my life or the character of the nature of God. So, oh God, fill that area of my life. Have access. Ephesians 5, 15. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but wise. Make every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, not to be foolish, but to understand what the Lord's will is. What is the Lord's will? Don't be drunk on wine, which leads to wild living. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And it's continually be filled with the Spirit there. The tense is ongoing. Be filled with the Spirit. Billy Graham was asked about this once. How is it, you know, how do, why do we need to keep being filled with the Spirit? He's like, because we leak. Bear in mind, Paul is writing to a group of believers here. If Paul is convinced that they get all they need at conversion, why would he encourage them to continually be filled with the Spirit? Again, exactly what that is. This is a bit of a mystery, but in Paul's mind, there's something more you need, or maybe something more God wants. Be filled with the Spirit. By the way, he, he contrasts this uh, to being drunk, the, a lot of scholars would say this is very classic Paul. He's pointing out there is, a, there is a manifestation of joy that people would go, well, you know, being drunk, you have this, you know, whatever. He says, no, no, that what's kind of, you know how people kind of throw off restraint when they're getting, having too much wine? He says, you kind of, that's the work of the Spirit. Throw off restraint. Throw off what people think. Go, go public with our faith. So you and I leave here right this morning. We can't go out as CIA, secret under, undercover agent Christians. There's no such thing. Yeah. Keep it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> Sing over one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs from the Spirit. There is a sense of we are filled as we sing the glory of wonders of God over each other. Sing and make music from your heart, always giving thanks to God the Father in the name. Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another in reverence of Christ. A lot of people don't like that sort of thing, being tagged into the work of the Holy Spirit, but it's there, so I had to put it in. Acts 10, 44, look at this. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on those who heard the message. Now, he has been sent to a group of Gentiles that he wasn't convinced could be saved. (laughs) Oh, I love how out of the box God is. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues, praise and praising God. And Peter said, 
Surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptized with water, for they've received the Holy Spirit as we have. So just when you think, you start, oh, I think, okay, you know, salvation and then filled. But these people got filled before they were baptized. They're kind of like, you know, it's that. <laughs> There's more of a mystery to this than we'd like. Oh, how does that all work? I don't know, but come on, Spirit of God, I need to be filled. There's more of your work in me to contend putting to death my old flesh. There's more of your work as far as the gifts of the Spirit for me to be a blessing to the body. There's more of your work for boldness to be a witness and advance the gospel in my generation. To believe to see high schools won for Christ. To believe to see a city won for Christ. To believe to see a nation turn to Christ. We need your Spirit, God, because you can do that. I can't. There's more room. There's more room in me, God. Help me yield. They experience the Spirit. That's what Paul says here. I, I need to get us back into standing for worship. Would you stand? I'm going to come back to this at some point. Would you stand this morning? They experienced the Spirit. There were tongues, a new language was received. They were expressive in their love for God, their whole body, emotion. It was all part of loving God. They boldly advanced the gospel. We've already talked about that. This is not the spirit moves. It's not so I can feel good about myself. Well, it kind of is. But it's also that I might go and make a difference in the world. It's for me, but not just for me. Church gets a little bit funny when we keep all this to ourselves. We weren't designed to. Some barriers to being filled. We doubt. I don't think I'm going to receive the filling of the spirit. Or fear what will happen to me if I receive this filling of the spirit. <laughs> people think if they know that I'm a Jesus freak <laughs> sit down with a DC talk <laughs> inadequacy I'm not good enough to receive the spirit oh we knew that so did Jesus that's why he came yes. to make it a gift that you could just receive we don't ask for the spirit and then if we ask, we don't keep on asking. These are all reasons we don't walk in the fullness of the Spirit. We are quenching the Spirit by our rejection of His ways. Luke eleven thirteen says, Then if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? been reminded again this beautiful gift Paul's encouragement that we would be filled and to continue to be filled with the Spirit of God thank you that when we put our trust in you Spirit of God you're already on the inside of us we're born again by the Spirit of God help us then to grow in our ability to yield to you Spirit of God to open up more and more of our lives. And I pray that today, this day, would be a moment of fresh experience, fresh encounter, fresh surrender, and a fresh receiving of the more, the fullness, the Holy Spirit you have in mind for us. Why don't you just respond to the Holy Spirit in your way for a moment? Come on, whatever's been going on in your heart and mind, as we've been talking about this, as we've been thinking about the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's your prayer this morning. Fill me, God. Fill me, Spirit of God. Fresh. Have more of me that I may have more of you. Have more of me that I may have more of you. More of your work in me. More of your power released in and through me. More of your guidance. I want to be sensitive to your guidance more and more and more. More of your freedom. More of your deliverance. More of your power. More of your grace. More of the gifts. Give me the gift of tongues, Lord. Come on, if you haven't got the gift of tongues, I, the tongues is an interesting one. Sometimes the church is gone a little bit far and said, you're not a Christian if you don't speak in tongues. I don't believe that. And, and it's not even one of the 
the more important gifts of calling to Paul. He says prophecy, but, but tongues is a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful prayer language. It's one, there's other reasons for it as well. Why don't you ask for the gift of tongues this morning? Because he wants to give it to you. That your spirit could, can commune with him in a way that bypasses where your mind gets stuck sometimes. Oh, Spirit of God, fill us. Fill us afresh. Now, I, I want to encourage you to avoid the temptation to duck out early. Because uh, I know for some of us that's tempting. And, and we're not going to take long, long, long extended amounts of time. But we do want to give opportunity for everyone that is here to respond in your own way and invite the Spirit of God to fill you afresh. Now, maybe you're here and you don't, you, you're not a Jesus follower. Well, I, I just, because we've just read about that, I believe that you can ins- encounter something of the Spirit of God this morning as well. Why don't you open your heart? Come on, the dry firewood that's here. Come on, there's a spark. There's an ignition coming from heaven. Come on, there's a rumbling. Ground around you was starting to become a bit unstable. And you thought you thought it was the enemy trying to destroy you. And God says, no, it wasn't the enemy trying to destroy you. It was me trying to prepare you for a fresh work of the Spirit in your life. Why don't you open to a fresh work of the Spirit in Jesus' Name? Come on, let's just sing for a moment. Let's just worship for a moment. We need you, Spirit of God. Fill us afresh. Fill us afresh. Fill us afresh. And again, just focus your heart. Say, Holy Spirit, come. One of the things that happens when the Spirit of God is poured out, according to Acts chapter 2, if you read on, is that we uh, encounter revelation from Jesus. The Bible talks about uh, the old men will dream dreams and the young men will see visions and the sons and daughters will prophesy. There's something when the Spirit of God moves where He begins to reveal what's in God's heart. So come on, just let Him speak. Let Him bring revelation. Let Him bring fresh vision. Vision of what your life can be in His hands. Vision of freedom. Visions of wholeness. Visions of being empowered for service and making a difference in the world. Let Him bring revelation. Let Him bring revelation of who Jesus is. Let Him bring revelation of the love of God towards you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord. I want to ask you to do something in just a moment and Um, because there's something powerful uh, in Scripture regarding the infilling of the Spirit to what the Bible calls about the laying on of hands. And uh, in the book, the author of the book of Hebrews talks about it being one of the basic foundations amongst other things. The laying on hands is an important part of our faith journey. I mean, so here we just kind of put our hands on someone's shoulder and we just pray for them. Just believing that as we put our hands on them, the Spirit of God is doing something through us. And so uh, some of you won't have come with somebody today. And so we're going to make sure everybody has an opportunity for prayer today. But if you are here with somebody, because this isn't about someone special praying for you, the prophet, the pastor. No, the Bible says we all have the Spirit of God in us. Therefore, we can all pray. We can all lay hands on the sick and see them recover. We can all lay hands and ask for a fresh filling of the Spirit. And I'd just love for you to take a moment just to turn to the people that you're here with today and just put your hand on their shoulder and just say a simple prayer. Just say, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled afresh with the Spirit.